I think, I can say in radio terms, I kind of broke the Roman Abramovich story, which is one of the reasons why I'm returning it today. Let me be clear, this is not a football story. This is not talk sport. I'm not a Chelsea supporter, and I like Roman Abramovich even less than I like Chelsea. But it was an act of self-harm, petty, puerile, self-disfiguring act by the government to effectively ban the owner of Chelsea from the FA Cup final where his own team was playing. A team that he, from his pocket, has invested many many hundreds of millions of pounds as part of the government's puerile and increasingly isolated Russophobic campaign of seeking to harm, damage, and quite possibly destroy our relations with an important European power just as we leave the European Union. It was of course, entirely discriminatory. London is chock full of oligarchs of different colours. It's chock full of people with their pockets full of dirty money. No one is suggesting that Abramovich's money is dirty. If it had been, he wouldn't have been allowed to own an English premiership club now, would he? Abramovich's money is therefore officially certified as clean. Yet, the government, by deliberately delaying the renewal of his visa, has encouraged him to become a citizen of Israel, which he did overnight, which is a story in itself. He thought, or we thought, perhaps hoped, that that would be the end of the matter. He could come and go visa-free, as a new citizen of Israel. But it's not the end of the story. Yesterday, in retaliation, Abramovich cancelled the £1 billion expenditure on the development of the Stamford Bridge Stadium, costing hundreds, maybe thousands of jobs, depriving the British economy of what would have been an accelerator, a multiplier, expenditure of one billion, which could have gone on to fuel billions more of economic activity, could have redeveloped entirely an important part of the London landscape. You see, actions have consequences. When you spit in someone's eye, when you spit in the well, don't imagine that you may regret not any longer being able to drink from it. That's an old Russian saying. It just occurred to me as quite an important one in this story. Don't spit in the well because you may have to drink from it. Well, we won't be drinking any more from Abramovich. So I hope Boris Johnson and the Foreign Office, who deliberately committed this act, are held to account for their actions. And I hope Boris Johnson is held to account for his actions in previous incarnations. Because I was seething with rage yesterday at the article in the London Review of Books which sought to place the blame for the towering inferno of Grenfell which incinerated scores of people and scorched the lives forever after of hundreds of people, children included. It sought to place the blame not on the manufacturers of cyanide panels who sold them against the regulations to a contractor who knowingly applied them to a tower block against the regulations, rather than the Kensington and Chelsea Council boffins and mandarins who signed off the work against the regulations, 
rather than those officials of KNC who ignored every warning from the people living in Grenfell Tower that their accommodation was a death trap. No, Andrew O'Hagan wants to blame the fire brigade. But he didn't blame the former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, for presiding over the decimation of London's firefighting capacity, about which the London Evening Standard had been entirely mute over the period of Johnson's eight years in power in City Hall in London. Actions have consequences. Unfortunately, the actions and the consequences are usually far removed from the people taking the actions. You see, Boris Johnson isn't going to die in a tower block on fire when the fire brigade can't reach you. And the new mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, God forbid, is not going to die in a hail of machine gun bullets in Brent, where I live, just moments away from where my children were playing in the garden. A man was shot down by 17 automatic fire bullets, a machine gun attack in daylight in London in 2018, in May. And I drove yesterday and today past Cathcart Road in Kensington, a posh part of Kensington, where the houses, terraced houses, cost millions of pounds. A father of three young children was stabbed to death in the street whilst going about his job as a delivery driver. No arrests have yet been made. It brought to 70 the number of people murdered in London, murdered in London, before the end of May. 70, placing us on track for a, a London record. We're already, we're already more dangerous than New York City. Imagine, the mayor of London is more concerned, at least that's how it looks to me, with the fact that London cyclists are too male, too middle class, and too white. You couldn't make this up. Instead of being out on the street, high viz, demanding the restoration of the government's London police cuts, instead of heading up a task force to come to grips with a murder rate which is simply terrifying, Londoners, the mayor is absent without leave, an invisible man. And I don't mean because he's a short man, I mean because he's a small man. I mean because he's too small for that job. That's my point of view. You can tell me yours, 0344 499 1000. Now, we'll also be talking about Donald Trump and the United States of America, our special relation, our closest ally, our leader, our father, if you believe the half-wits who run our affairs and report them in the mainstream media. He's just declared war on us. He's just declared war on our industry, on European industry. But hey, Russia's the enemy, isn't it? Not the United States, not Trump, it's Putin who is the enemy. But it's Trump and the USA that just drove a bulldozer through our economic interests with the sanctions he has just applied. And on the subject of Russia, we'll be talking about the miracle that is the London Evening Standard. 
It's a miracle in the way that, according to the laws of aerodynamics, the bumblebee cannot fly. The London Evening Standard is owned by the former KGB station chief at the Soviet Embassy in London. Don't ask me how I know that. It is a free newspaper that just jumped the shark, which, if we hadn't had a whistleblower, we wouldn't necessarily have known, is offering big corporations positive media coverage in exchange for cash. And hey, who's the editor of the London Evening Standard? It's Georgie. He's bound to be leaving on a jet plane. He's on jet plane, isn't he? <clears throat> Why should Abramovich pump money into the British economy, pump money into an iconic piece of Britain's football architecture when we won't even give him a visa to come to the cup final? Now I'm joined by Martin Dua Lipton. Why Dua, D-U-A? Martin Dua Lipton, who is the chief football writer on the sun, a man who knows the game inside out. Uh, to talk about this, Martin, it's not really a football story. I don't support Chelsea. I don't even like Abramovich. But this was an act of self-harm by the British uh, Foreign Office, wasn't it? Well, that's certainly the view of uh, Mr Abramovich and, by extension, Chelsea. Others might take a different view. I'm really a sports writer rather than a politician, but clearly the ongoing situation between the UK and, and Russia, which uh, kick-started with the Skripal affair, has, uh, has heightened tensions. And there does appear to be a definite attempt by the government to target Putin's favourite oligarchs, one of whom is Ivanovich. I'm not so sure uh, about that. Maybe you know more about football than me and I know more about politics than you. In fact, Abramovich grew fat, uh, financially speaking, under Boris Yeltsin, and he was a big favourite. He did indeed. He but was a big favourite in London. Uh, but but let's Putin, talk about the he? consequence. He's an of Putin, isn't he? Uh, he is. He's, he's, he's one of his favourite one of his favourite men. Yes, indeed. As did Berezovsky, grew fat on the on the proceeds of Yeltsin. Berezovsky fell out of favour with uh, with Putin, as we know, in the Russian government, and ended up in exile. And uh, we we are led to believe he's committed suicide. Other views are out there, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> you do know about politics, Martin. It's just that you're wrong about them. But anyway, the uh, football implications. All about opinion, George. All about opinions. It's a game of opinions, <laughs> Martin. It's a game of opinions. <laughs> now, listen, um, the consequences could be serious. Uh, um, my, old, my mate, uh, Bob Mills, uh, through the sport, uh, talk sport, uh, made the point this morning that Chelsea were always one assassin's bullet away from the championship. Uh, there's not been, thank God, an assassin's bullet on Abramovich, but it's been a financial bullet. And uh, at the very least, he's not going to be as keen uh, pumping money into Chelsea uh, in the future, is he? Well, you wouldn't have thought so. Uh, they, the club insist to the contrary, what they would do, wouldn't they? Um, but it does seem hard to expect a man who cannot um, legally, as it were, come uh, uh, and work in the UK, which he, which he can't, um, to spend a fortune on, on the club. I think that's a legitimate argument that, uh, that Chelsea are pushing in. And they're insistent that he will still back the team, that there'll be no um, direct in, uh, impact on the football club and that he's not looking to get out. How much do you reckon he spent, people, Martin? Well, he, he hosed the best part of one and a half billion pounds. My goodness, that's even more than I thought. Uh, in his billion. in his time, uh, and that's you know he was he was looking to commit. Uh, well, it's a billion pound stadium now. Whether or not he was willing to spend all of that himself from his money, no, he's not sure. With you, Bob, I think he's estimated wealth is nine billion. Yeah. He's done quite well out of uh, out of the sale of uh, of his various assets in various times, and uh, obviously he was. He was one. He was Sibneft, which was then sold to Gazprom, which obviously is a rather large concern. And he's also and I think, of course, it shows he's owned by this holding company, Fordstam, as well. So it's not direct. He loaned Chelsea a huge sum of money, and it's and he doesn't want it back. It's money he owes to himself, effectively. Yeah. Um, and also, if he were to sell, he would get north of a billion pounds for Chelsea in the current market conditions it is a big european club and so he would you know there, there, and, and i'm sure out there there are people who want to buy a bit of a, of a massive premier league club and so, so therefore 
the long-term uh, complications for Chelsea are, are less than the short-term implications. What's going to happen this summer? Is he going to spend money on players? Is he going to spend money on managers? Is he going to, to, to have the same involvement and determination to improve the club that he did when he came in in 2003 and since? Oh, big questions. Uh, the, the talk this morning uh, is that Chelsea could be in for trying to persuade Zinedine Zidane to become their manager. That would uh, not be helped by the current uncertainty. The stadium announcement yesterday. What stage was that at, Martin? I mean, they hadn't. there was no cranes on site, was there? It was something well, no. uh, on the drawing board. So it's, it's, been it's just been folded away. Four years. Um, they finally got planning consent by, by um, reaching an arrangement, shall we say, with the local protesters, uh, and there have been issues that did need some financial inducement, I think it's fair to say, to, <laughs> to find, uh, find common ground on those issues. Um, they, the plan was to, because, it was a, because of the sheer nature of the project, which was a, a, a total rebuild, and the um, conditions of the site, they'd have had to move out of the ground for four years whilst this was, was ongoing. And other issues then came out. Just the recent issue with Wembley made it very difficult because the initial plan was for them to move to Wembley for four years. But Spurs are not going to be beached there. No, Spurs are going to be okay. They're you think? Fine. They'll be, yeah, they're, they're, they'll, they're, they're, they may play a maximum of one game there next season. The rest will all be at the new, the new Tottenham ground. But that wasn't to start at Chelsea until 2021 anyhow. Right. So it was two years down the line. But this proposed deal with Shahid Khan to buy from the Fulham owner to buy Wembley to play the NFL season there would have meant it, out, it, it was out of commission between October, between August and end of December for football. Mm. So Chelsea couldn't play there. So therefore, the, the only option theoretically, I think, that was viable in terms of um, stadium size but not particularly welcome would have been West Ham and the London Stadium because that has provision for a second tenant. Um, Chelsea couldn't move to Brentford or Fulham or QPR for four years because the capacity of those grounds is too small. So I think the, the Wembley issue may have complicated matters for Abramovich, but I think more is he has just got the raging hump mm. with the UK government. Might be Hackney Marshes in the end. Thanks very much indeed, Martin Lipton, chief sports reporter at The Sun on the Abramovich story. Well, I like that one. Now, uh, you heard my... Uh, encounter with the Sun's chief sports reporter on the Abramovich issue, which of course is not a football issue, but a political one. Uh, let's hear from Gary in Maidenhead. Go ahead, Gary. Good morning, George. It's morning. good to talk to you. Thank you, uh, sir. I'm not much of an authority on football or Abramovich, but I'm appalled at the, uh, the way in which this whole thing has been dealt with. And you and I share a lot of, a lot of views, George, and I'm a great fan of yours, but Thank you. the one thing that I detest above everything else is hypocrisy yep. and a detestation of hypocrites. Yep. The last time we spoke about dirty money, the dirty money coming so-called so out of Russia doesn't hold a candle to the dirty money of the West. No, that's a and fact. Yeah. I, I we've we've even got our own islands in the Caribbean, uh, which uh, are a toilet for dirty money. Absolutely. And I mean, what, uh, what could be dirtier than the money we derive by selling arms to a despotic nation like the Saudis mm -hmm. that conduct war and kill innocent people in the process. To me, that's the dirtiest of dirty money. And by the way, a lot of them we've sold to somebody who may, uh, in fact, be dead, uh, like El Cid, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Uh, oh, really? Uh, maybe, well, uh, there was uh, a coup, which we were told by the fake news media, yep. uh, was uh, people shooting at a drone, which had appeared over the... Uh, royal Palace. This is now at least six weeks ago, maybe more, and the Crown Prince has not been seen since. My God, I didn't know that. Mohammed bin Sultan, the one who yeah. came here in a, a billion-dollar blaze of paid-for publicity, uh, the modernizer, uh, the man who was setting Saudi women free and who left with a pocket full of British weapons, may very well be dead. And an announcement may well be forthcoming soon. My God, I had no idea, George. No yep. idea. George, I, I'm an old man, been around a long time. I've listened to everything that you've said. I found it very difficult to contradict anything. Um, I'm a great fan of yours. 
I love Jeremy Corbyn, but he's too nice a guy. He's an honest man, and the mass media don't know how to handle this. So they deal in lies and trivia to demonize the man. All that is true. Uh, and, uh, and the fact I, that he's a nice man is how he got on the ballot. If, yes. he, if he'd been a man like me, not that nice, uh, <laughs> he, he would never have got on the, on well, the ballot. You see, that's the problem. It's debatable, uh, George. I think we need a fighter. I'm a fighter as well. I'm an old man now, but I've been a fighter all of my life. Well, me too. And uh, that, that's really the point I'm making, Gary, that uh, if Corbyn had been more like me, he wouldn't have got 14 nominations, wouldn't have been on the ballot paper, and no, now wouldn't be the leader of the Labour Party. But, no. but, but they, they the need very you things. Like Ali needed uh, Angelo Dundee. They need you in the corner, buddy. Angelo Dundee. Now, that's a very good metaphor as I come yes. from Dundee. Um, and uh, I grew uh, up thinking he must be from our town. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. he, but, uh, no, but the point I'm making is that if Jeremy. Uh, was more like me, would never have been the leader, but the things that got him on the ballot paper are the things, in my view, that are holding him back. Uh, yeah. The yeah. the niceness that got him on the ballot is stopping him it's from doing the him. things that he should do. Yeah, you see, he's on the back here, back foot the whole time. He's, yeah, yeah. They've, they've found something they can really attack. Not that he doesn't bow low enough, not that he doesn't wear a tie. They said he's anti-Semitic. Oh, well, it, see, you see on that point, I mean, let me give you one from today's newspapers. There's a vile, baseless, shameful and self-harming attack on Corbyn today uh, from, I think, the former president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, Mr. Arkush. Right. Now, from the first day that Arkush was attacking Corbyn, Corbyn should have been saying back, you are a multi-million pound donor to the Conservative Party. Right. You are a Tory. You have a reason for smearing me with this baseless stuff. That's right. But those words have never crossed his lips. Yeah. He has never pointed out that the man attacking him on a daily basis in ever more vile and unacceptable terms is a huge donor to the Conservative Party. There you go. Unbelievable, George. Well... Totally believable. Yes, alas, yeah, only totally too believable. believable. Gary, thanks for a very nice call uh, from Maidenhead. Let me uh, go through some of the written uh, material. Uh, talking Pothole Britain Roads with George Galloway at 10.45 this morning on Talk Radio. 400 cyclists died or were maimed in the last 10 years hitting potholes. She, you may think it a trivial issue. But someone who spends a lot of time in Manchester, which has the worst roads in Britain, which look like they've been the subject of a bombing run by the RAF, I tell you, potholes are a very important issue. Uh, hi, George. Maybe the Russians should start chopping limbs and heads and buy some Western weapons and things. Would be rosy again. By the way, what happened to the Russia-French ship deal? Well, uh, that's not got a name on it, that SMS, but... Uh, my friend, uh, you're right. If the, if the Russians were chopping limbs and heads, maybe we'd be giving them or even selling them weapons. Um, as to the French-Russian trade uh, agreements, including in military hardware, I'm sure that's all going fine. That's why the uh, optics of the President Macron, President Putin uh, encounter in Russia just last week we're all so very positive. Whoever's choosing this music is doing perfectly, I must say, because we're going to be talking about potholes in just one minute, but uh, living up to my reputation that every time I'm on air, something important happens. The Spanish Prime Minister has just been toppled, dismissed by the President of uh, the Parliament as the loser in a no-confidence vote caused by a corruption scandal. A new prime minister is being sworn in and we'll try and get you further and better particulars on that. My goodness, isn't the European Union in trouble? Now, I said earlier, potholes are no laughing matter and that's before I knew the numbers of people who have been killed and maimed as a result of them on top of their bicycles. Mark Morell is Mr. Pothole. He's a former gas engineer, uh, and now he's best known 
for campaigning against the curse of potholes. Mark, thanks for joining me. No, no, George. Just spell out the scale of this problem, will you? I mean, 400 cyclists have either been killed or maimed in the last 10 years as a result of potholes. In some cases where councils knew of defects beforehand, have either done poor repairs or failed to do repairs in the required timescales. Now, that's a lot of uh, physical damage. Of course, there's uh, the damage to cars, uh, tyres, the uh, cause of congestion and so on. I mean, this, can you put a number on it? I mean, yeah. this, uh, this, the, the, this is causing real damage to the economy and to people. It's estimated to cost over £5 billion a year to the UK economy through badly maintained roads. The amount that counts, uh, motorists pay in over £50 billion through various taxations is not going to maintain in our road network. You will get big figures from government, Department of Transport about investment, but that's all about smoke, smart motorways, extra lane capacity. Well, a lot of that's about charging you for the future because they realise with the advent of uh, different fuels that uh, they won't be able to take it at the pump. So that investment's only about pulling money in the future. Very little of the £23 billion that they use is a really big figure that puts most people off goes through to local road maintenance, about £1 billion on an asset that's worth over £500 billion. Now, the uh, causes of uh, uh, potholes are, of course, uh, the weather that we have, lots of rain and so on, but there must also be an issue of faulty work. Uh, I mean, I've seen potholes in roads that have only uh, comparatively recently been redone. Uh, yeah. Isn't there any way that the local state or the national state authorities can can get money back, force uh, poor work to be redone uh, better? Yeah, I mean, taking your point, <clears throat> surprise, surprise, well-maintained roads don't get affected by bad weather. It's through lack of maintenance for years, the decades, that create the problem with the small cracks and fissures. You'll see some work carried out when they try to do things like surface dressing. And it is a very good technique. But what happens is that um, the government, they haven't got assurances of, of spend over a long-term basis. They should be doing remedial works prior to doing the surfacing work. If they don't do the remedial works at least either 12 months to maybe six months in advance, when they do the surfacing work, you're going to get failures. You're and just papering over cracks. Yeah, I mean, at home, use the example of a hole in the wall. If you put polyfiller in a hole in the wall, <coughs> when you do the polyfiller, it will sink in. You fill it again, you rub it off, and then you decorate. What they're doing is doing the polyfiller and then putting the, uh, doing the decorate straight after, and because you end up with the, the effect. So it's, that's part of the problem. Also, there's not enough supervision by local authorities because they've outsourced so much to service providers. They don't know what's going on in the network. They rely on the contractor far too heavily. They do not police the contracts. Poor contract management is a, a, another issue there. So, you know, 80% of it is about funding, but the other 20% is about poor contract management, quality control, um, resourcing, training, uh, and knowledge, really. I think there's a complete lack of knowledge. Um, the good old highways engineers and are very few and far between. Some of the authorities that have had strong highways engineers up until very recently have got far less backlog and problems with their network than the rest of them. Interesting. Is the is this problem spread throughout the land? Uh, I mean, I spend most of my time in London, but the rest of it in Manchester. Manchester has the worst roads in Britain, in my experience. Uh, it's across the country. I mean, I, I actually been out this week with uh, in, in Oxfordshire and uh, found a, 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 a particular road that I mean is shot for shot to pieces and uh, found massive defects in rural roads, and I know the MP over there has mentioned it in the House a couple of times, but you get platitudes from government. Uh, but they, one thing, George, they can't hide the state of our roads. They can spin as much as they like, but I like the hashtag, our roads don't lie. Well, that's a fact, yeah, that's a fact. Do you happen to know, it's a bit left field as a question you may not know, uh, are there other uh, countries with climates like ours that don't suffer in the way that our people are suffering from this? Yeah, I mean, France gets some similar weather, the northern bit of France. It's not that far away from us, is it? It's only no. just over the channel. Yeah. And I was actually talking to an ex-mayor who's a senator over there. And the way they've that their councils operate is they've got 50% direct and 50% contract staff. The actual direct staff oversee all, all the quality of the works that are being carried out. 
uh, on their road networks. So, um, and actually over there as well, they actually ring fence money and put it into roads. We don't do those things. We've gone away to service providers and how wonderful the contractors are. But from my own experience in the gas industry managing contracts, a contractor is as good as you make them. So, you know, they've proven that by having the right mix and the right controls and giving local ownership to the people um, and doing correct funding, you can end up in a far better situation in terms of your road networks. I mean, we're the sixth richest economy and we're about 25th in terms of the quality of our roads. 25th. Um, Yep, and okay. therefore places like France, Portugal, you know, Cyprus are above us. I mean, there's inherently an overhaul of our net, the way we look after our network, an idea about um, not ring fencing um, taxes, which government stuck to for years and years and years. Well, they need to actually smell the coffee. I think there's a sense of change that, you know, you need to actually invest some of the road money that we put in as motorists and taxpayers into roads because they're so vital. They're the you know, blood supply for the UK economy, really. It all sounds disturbingly like a metaphor for, uh, for Britain's uh, overall uh, state, uh, not just in terms of the roads. Mark, how do people help you? How do they uh, hook up with you? Is it on Twitter only or have you got a website? Uh, I used to have a website, George, but I got attacked so many times. I spent so much time doing work on it, and it's costing me money that I took it down. I'm on Twitter as Mr. Pottle UK. I've also got a Facebook page, um, so that's the best way. Please, please get people to report potholes because you may save someone from uh, someone's life or someone getting injured or claimed. Um, I know that the councils have got thousands of backlogs, but they've got to get through it this summer because it, it's not. We, I mean, it's Armageddon on our roads. Mark Morell, Mr. Pothole UK, thanks for coming on the mother of all talk shows. Let me read some of the printed uh, material coming my way. Uh, Patrick says, uh, quite right to highlight Abramovich's debacle. As a Chelsea supporter, I'm disgusted with my so-called government's actions, re the visa, etc. And now we've lost our new stadium. I just hope we're not playing our home matches in Tel Aviv next year. He may actually uh, pull out of Chelsea and uh, put his money into uh, Israeli football. Who knows? Chris M says it's astonishing with the NHS on its knees. The government chooses to deport Commonwealth doctors and nurses and stop them coming in. Now they're depriving billion, uh, billions of Russian legitimate investment in London over stupidity. This government is a joke. And Fra says, I wonder, will Abramovich buy a football club in Israel? Stranger things have happened. And Russell says, special relationship only in the minds of the UK governments. The US has and always will put itself at number one. The rest of the world can go fly a kite. Let's take a call from Martin in Donegal. Martin, welcome. George, how are you getting on? Oh, very good, thanks. Nice to hear from you. Can I, can we, um, I, I just wanted to know what you thought of... Uh... Perhaps Indy Ref 2 in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, seems to be, you know, hoping for a second referendum on Scottish independence. Well, Welcome, you, you, uh, bring yeah, it on, were... bring it on, I say. Um, I uh, think that the Scottish Parliament has the right to hold a referendum every year if they like, though they will pay a political price the more times they return to the well. Um, Nicola Sturgeon uh, is defying the poll results uh, which indicate that uh, quite a considerable majority of people don't want an Indy Ref 2, uh, but she's the First Minister. If she can get a majority in the Parliament for it, I say bring it on. And um, you know, Obviously yourself, you wouldn't be for an independent Scotland. Would, would you see an independent Scotland as being too uh, nationalist? Would you think it, you know, as, as, um, as somebody says, you wouldn't buy your dream house just because you don't like the wallpaper. You know, you, you get the keys of the house and then change the wallpaper. You know, well, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, generally, I'm generally against uh, partition. Uh, and uh, yeah. in Donegal, uh, you know all about that. Um, yeah. your, your small island was partitioned into two it different was. states. And uh, I've opposed that all my life. So I'm hardly going to uh, support it on my own small island. Uh, but, you know, uh, Wales, England and Scotland are three different countries within the United Kingdom. I know Ireland uh, was colonised and partitioned and whatever, like, you know. Yeah, Scotland was never colonised, of course. Scotland was a coloniser. Yeah. 
You see, this is, yeah. uh, this is a common uh, error the Irish nationalists make of imagining that there's any comparison between Scotland and Ireland. In fact, there's not. Uh, Ireland was a colonised country and Scotland was doing the colonising. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, I just I think myself, you know, if, um, I, I, you know the, Scottish, the Scottish people have their own language, their own the same as they Ireland. They don't have their own language. That's nonsense. They don't have their own it's, language. It's, uh, well, they had their own language till it was taken away, like, you know... The, the, well, the I don't know if it was taken thing. away, but if it was taken away, that was more than 300 years ago. Uh, uh, and there, know, there's but... more people speak Polish in Scotland uh, than... <laughs> well, that's a fact. There's far more there's people probably, speak Urdu in Scotland probably, than speak uh, than speak the Gaelic. But with all respect to... The, Ireland. With, with all respect to the Gaelic, uh, Scotland doesn't have its own language. And it's my belief that after 300 years... The interests of the Scottish and English working people are one and the same, and uh, I'm I'm of the view that the problem with the world today is not that there are not enough countries, uh, that there are uh, uh, not enough states. Uh, there's too many countries. There's too many states, and uh, so forgive me. Um, I support uh, the reunification of Ireland, and I support the unification of Britain. The key is the word unification. All right, OK. Fair enough. I always knew the last referendum, you know, um, I know uh, Tommy Sheridan, I know you, you, I'm sure you know well of Tommy. Um, uh, he, he was for, you know, the... Um, well, the, Tommy's been Scotland. everything, yeah? Uh, Tommy uh, was once a fanatic anti-separatist uh, campaigner, right. as he was a yeah. fanatic anti-EU campaigner. Now he's in yeah, favour of the yeah. EU and separatism. I'm right, constant right, as right. the Northern Star, Martin. Uh, you just have to look up and you'll see me standing in the same place on the same issues all the time. Been a pleasure, Martin, in Donegal, great part of the world. Um, Fra says, sorry to hear your family were so close to the violence that's gripping London and the north of England. A sign of things to come, unfortunately. Stay safe, stay safe but stay strong. Thank you, Fra. Um, and Julia says cash-strapped councils would rather pay out for damages than pay out the greater cost of repairing roads. Same for clearing snow in city centres. The payout for damages is often less than the cost of repairs. Fascinating. Well, this is the mother of all talk shows. The right-wing Spanish Prime Minister has fallen. Rajoy is no more. And... A socialist prime minister, Mr. Sanchez, hope he's more effective than the one we got from Arsenal, in parenthesis, Mr. Sanchez of the Spanish Socialist Party, is the new prime minister at the head of a minority government composed of socialists, other leftists and Catalan nationalists. Uh, doesn't sound all that stable, probably be an election soon enough, but it is a historic day. So, of course, it happened during the time that the mother of all talk shows was on the air. We'll be talking about that later. But you may have heard, I hope you did, uh, what I had to say earlier about the crime wave in London. I know it's not only in London, but as I live here, and I'm now living within sound of the machine gun bullets in the London borough of Brent, in which I live, 17 machine gun bullets were pumped into a man within five minutes of where my children were playing in their garden. And coming to work this morning, I drove past leafy Cathcart Road in Kensington, all taped off, several streets all taped off, where a working man, a delivery driver, was stabbed to death the night before. And yet, and yet, nobody seems to be getting to grips with it. Even worse, nobody seems even to be trying. Nothing exceptional anyway. That's my view from the London street. My next guest knows far more. Former police officer for 31 years, a knife crime and gun crime expert and an advocate of armed police, it says here. Norman Brennan is his name and he's very welcome indeed. Norman, welcome back. Yeah, good morning, George. What kind of London are we in now? We're more violent than New York City. 70 murders before the end of May, uh, before June uh, dawned. Uh, it's 
it's actually now getting quite frightening, at least for me. As I say, I was five minutes away from the machine gun attack last night. Absolutely. I mean, it's becoming like uh, New York in the olden days, um, where gun and knife crime and homicide uh, become an everyday uh, news item, uh, so much so that uh, it became the norm. The exact same is happening in Britain, and in particular London, as you discuss. I live in Twickenham, and two weeks ago, uh, a young lad only a mile from where I live was stabbed. Uh, at the weekend, a bank holiday weekend, a mile from where I live in Richmond, another young lad was stabbed. So it's not just happening now in the crime areas, which were predominantly seen as Holston, places like Croydon. Croydon now is the gun knife capital of London. Really? And you're right, it's out of control. It is out of control, and you're absolutely right in your uh, overview, is that everybody talks about what needs to be done. Nobody does it. They throw a bit of money, and Mr Carr, our London mayor now, all he says is that... uh, I'm very concerned. Best wishes to the family. I'm in touch with the Met Police. We need substantially more than that. He He's fantastically uh, invisible. And the only... I mean, uh, I'm prejudiced uh, against him uh, on political grounds. Uh, I, I make that clear in terms of full disclosure. Uh, but uh, I can't think that the two previous mayors of London, Johnson or Livingston, would not be would not have a higher profile demanding that something must be done and doing it. Uh, I suppose maybe I'm being unfair. He's not here to answer for himself because he never accepts our invitation to come on the uh, show. But nobody at a London level or a UK level seems to be getting to grips with this, Norman thing is, George, it's all about money. Uh, you may recall, and I'm sure you do, you're quite an acute uh, individual, is that uh, about three years ago, the Home Secretary um, attended the National Police Conference and she accused everybody uh, within the police service of crime wolf. Yeah. Well, I don't have to tell you or any of your listeners. The wolves are here crime now. Crime figures. Yep, the homicide out of control, gun crime is out of control, knife crime is out of control. Back in, and I keep saying to your listeners and many others, in fact, I'm fed up doing interviews now because I seem to go around in circles. Back in 2004, on the 13th of December, uh, I was in New York at the time uh, because I used to take all the police to New York on the 9-11 memorials. I got a phone call, I think, from the Telegraph. They said uh, a financier has been stabbed to death on his doorstep in Chelsea and in Chiswick, an ex-school teacher or a school teacher, an ex-finance person himself, was killed in his own house. And I was walking across Times Square with my operations director, and suddenly in my head, I thought of knives destroy lives. So a week and a half later, after flying back, I held a press conference, one of the largest press conferences this country has seen, and in full uniform, risking my career, with Damalola Taylor's father and many other families in London where somebody had been stabbed to death, I gave an idea and an outline of what's going to happen if we don't get a grips on knife crime. And here we are, all these years on, talking about all the things that I predicted. And the caveat to what I've just said, George, is that Theresa May turned up at the Police Federation Conference and she accused the federation that represents the whole police service, I'm a bit like the Robin Hood, I also represent the police and have done for 25 years, accused them of crime wolf. Well, I predicted over the last five years that the perfect storm was coming. Nobody was listening, nobody was acting, everyone was talking. Talk is cheap, action seems to be a lot different. Here we are now. The storm has hit Britain, and in particular London. We are now facing the effects of the tsunami. And if I was to describe the overview in medical terms, I've already described it over the last five years. Nobody listened, or if they did, they didn't act, that we were on life support. I'm now telling you, George, the family are around the bed. Wow. That's very powerful, uh, Norman. Now, uh, maybe uh, the fact that it's now no longer knives alone. It's no longer guns alone. It's machine guns. And now that it's no longer just Harlesden, uh, but Twickenham and Richmond and Kensington, maybe the fact that anybody could be a victim of this. You don't need to be in a gang. You don't need to be a young black boy. You can be anybody at all, living anywhere at all, doing any job at all. 
and be the victim, often in broad daylight, of this murder and mayhem, maybe that, maybe I'm being too hopeful, maybe that will waken people up? No, it won't. Really? Uh, you're right. Again, um, we, I was on a robbery squad when I was serving for six years. And, for example, places on the West Way where people would uh, get caught in uh, traffic jams, you'd have people on motorbikes, pedal cycles, and even on foot come along and struggle with somebody's Rolex watch or a bag on the uh, table. You will also see, or, or on their, uh, sorry, passenger seat, you will also see, George, that uh, moped crime has now uh, risen extra, extramentally uh, in five years, 1,600%, not 5%, not 10%, which would be bad in itself, 1,600%. It's madness out there. I'm in touch with tens of thousands of police officers because I represent them. I wear a very privileged hat because I also represent victims of crime and the public. Now, I pose this question. If I went to the country tomorrow or within the next month, and there might be a little bit of a warmer for you there, and I called the country's bluff, and I said I have put a 10-year plan together, which has taken me 10 years, 40 years experience. I sit on the moon. I look at all of the aspects, I look at my views, I look at others' views, and I take them all in. I'm not blinkered, I'm not bigoted. And I said, here is a 10-year plan, ladies and gentlemen. Your apathy has allowed the government off the hook to take effective action. They've taken away 21,805 police officers. We have to cope with more than less. Would you support a major organisation that is run by someone that is not prepared to be ignored or controlled? The third is destroyed, which is what happens when you stand up in Britain alone. That's why there's no one independently representing you, George, or me. How many of the public would say, I'm with you, Norm? Because very soon, you and me, George, will be able to sit back and just see whether we've lost the plot or whether the country has said, do you know what, Norman, enough's enough. We're glad that someone that's not the mayor, that's not Theresa May, that's destroyed the police service, that not all these good talkers, somebody actually cares about us and wants to make a difference. Let's watch this space, George, because the thing is, I'm not over hopeful, but I always have to look for that light at the end of the tunnel. Otherwise, what hope is there apart from anarchy? Well, uh, anarchy is a good description. We're not yet in anarchy because there is still at least a thin blue line and everyone who lives in London sees the police scurrying, hurtling hither and thither all the time, sirens blaring. Uh, and in fact, sometimes that in itself becomes uh, really disturbing mood music. Uh, I, th I think if I moved my children out of London, they wouldn't know uh, into the countryside. They wouldn't know what was happening. Why is there no sirens? Um, so there's still a thin blue line, at least, uh, and thinned dramatically by the government. Um, transparent is the better word. Yeah, well, transparent. It's invisible. Well, I mean, thank God they're there, but uh, they can't hold the fort Uh we may be on the verge of a critical mass of lawlessness and criminal violence, and I'm not sure how easy it is to climb back from that. You're right. Um, when you when I've talked about the perfect storm and the tsunami, the tsunami is the one where you think, well, wow, that was pretty bad, and then the tsunami hits you, and it's how bad that the tsunami actually hits you. You talk about policing. We talk about men and women that are members of the public because the public are the police, the police are the public. Last year, there were 22,000 individual assaults on my colleagues. Some were maimed, others forced to leave the job. On a shift at last bank holiday, I saw on my Twitter feed the other day, out of a shift of 11 officers, eight, eight were assaulted. And often when it goes to court, and I'll just give you an overview about how much we seem to care about the protectors of society, you often find out that if someone has been nicked, for example, for shoplifting, a theft, pedal cycle theft, a burglary, we attend, uh, and we actually do attend at times, believe it or not, although we don't turn, attend all of them, and somebody gives us a good kicking and a good punching, when it goes to court, you're more likely to face a stiffer penalty than assault on a police officer. An assault on police officers nowadays, and don't forget, we are your protectors. You know, it might not like us all the time, but I read police officers that pull people out the river last night at 4 a.m. this morning. Police officers that talk people off of a bridge 5 o'clock this morning from committing suicide. And what they say is, this morning I talked someone out of suicide. We talked for an hour. 
I shook their hand. That was not a waste of time. These are all the things that you don't hear about policing. You hear about, we're nicking you for speeding. We're too busy doing this. We're too busy doing that. That doesn't relate to, think, to, to, to policing. I agree, wearing high heels, painting fingernails, an absolute nonsense. Stop wasting your time. I tell my colleagues that. But we have got a system in this country where law and order, I'm afraid, is broken. And the camel's back, that straw, is gun crime and knife crime and people living in fear. I can't dress, dress it up anymore, George. We still care. You're right, there are still police officers that risk their lives day in and day out. But they are now leaving in their droves. What does that tell you? Well, it's a very, very powerful interview, Norman Brennan, and uh, I can't wait for the next uh, chapter uh, that you teased us with uh, today. Thanks very much for joining us. That was the highlight of the royal wedding, wasn't it? Simply a beautiful rendition of that great, great song. Now, uh, they're not singing in the right-wing camp in the Spanish Parliament, the Cortes, this morning because the leader of the popular party, PP, Turns out not to be so popular after all. He's just been defenestrated. He's just been tossed out of office and replaced by the Jeremy Corbyn equivalent, or is he the leader of the Socialist Party in Spain? Atop, it must be said, a fairly rickety coalition uh, minority government. We are privileged to hear, though only briefly, I understand, from the Emeritus Professor of Contemporary Spanish Studies at the London School of Economics, Professor Sebastian Balfour, on this breaking news. Professor, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. Do say uh, when you need to go, uh, but if you're able succinctly to tell us, what was the cause of the crisis that brought the Prime Minister down? Essentially, it was the uh, corruption scandals that envelop the uh, popular party uh, and a case came to its final conclusion recently over one of those issues of corruption perhaps the major one uh, which involved um, money laundering uh, bribery backhanders and and so on and so forth and that was sufficient to swing a number of parties towards the proposal the motion of no confidence put forward by the socialist party and uh, was it decisively passed, by the way? I haven't seen the numbers. Yes. Um, a majority, an absolute majority is 176 uh, of, of the 350 uh, seats in the, in the parliament. It won by 180 votes. OK, so that's so that, uh, that quite an convincing. Majority. And is that but, the but, end of Rajoy, or uh, will he stay on as the leader of the PP? I doubt it. But then, you know, anything is possible. He's, a, he's been a, a, something of a survivor. Uh, so he may he may stay on, but I suspect not, uh, because what's waiting in the wings uh, is a party that seeks to replace the popular party as a conservative option in, in Spain. And that is the Citizens Party, as it's called. Um, and they at the moment, what they would like is to have vote to have elections soon because they would uh, win a lot of votes from the popular party as a result of this this scandal. Now, what can you tell us uh, about the uh, new prime minister and his party? I, I lost track of the Spanish Socialist Party some time ago, concentrating on others to the left of them. Uh, what, what's he like, the new prime minister? Well, it's difficult to know. I mean, he has certainly campaigned quite vociferously uh, against policies which have brought about high levels of unemployment, uh, he's, he's um, also the, the uh, you know cuts that have been taking place and so on and so forth. Um, so we know that his, his credentials are social democratic, should we say, left social democratic. Mm. Is he Blair uh, or is he Corbyn? Uh, I wouldn't say he's either because the context in Spain is so very different. And the, the different interests within the Socialist Party uh, are, are such that it's difficult to make any sort of comparison of that, of that nature. We don't know him really yet uh, terribly well uh, because he's only been around for a few years, I mean, as, a, uh, as the leader of the Socialist Party. Um, what is unclear as well is what kind of policies he would uh, enact uh, as prime minister. The problem is that uh, his party only has 84 seats. 
you know, out of a total of 350, that is a very fragile position. Yeah. Is he going to form? Is he going to form a coalition with the the Podemos? That's the left populist party. Um, even so, even if he did form a coalition with them, he would have to count on the votes of regional nationalist parties, and they want. Uh, a change in the constitution to allow the right of self-determination and that includes the the catalan nationalist parties who of course voted for uh, voted for this this uh, notion of no confidence uh, simply because they wanted to get rid of the popular party so we've got a very uncertain fragile situation awaiting us and podemos uh, would be running the kind of liberal democrat risk of uh, propping up uh, a prime minister, not getting many of their own policies in return and being punished by the electorate when the uh, next election comes. Uh, they Absolutely. might be reluctant to uh, to give support to the yeah, yeah, uh, PS, yeah. PSOE. You're absolutely right, except the, the leader, uh, Pablo Iglesias, has suggested uh, that he could play some role in, in the new government. But again, that's, some, that's a comment perhaps made to the press, and it's not clear whether this is a policy of, uh, you know, that would be sanctioned by, the, by Podemos. But you're absolutely right uh, that it would be a poison chalice you know, to, to, be, to become part of the, the, the socialist government in the sense that... Um, the policies of Podemos would not be able to be uh, carried out as, as Podemos would like. Finally, and I'm grateful for your time, Professor, a general election sometime soon, uh, just like in Italy, maybe just like in Britain. It's, uh, it's uh, far from strong and stable, the European political scene, is it? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, but I don't think that Spain um, is a weak flank at all in 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 the EU, in the sense that uh, you know all major parties there are pro EU, um, and there is no upstart uh, populist party that is uh, calling for uh, you know moving out of the euro or for uh, you know anti anti EU policies of one sort or the other. So Spain is not a, a risk. Although, of course, it's not a very powerful economy uh, as, as, as Italy is within the EU. Professor, deeply grateful for your time and your wisdom. Professor Sebastian Balfour, Emeritus Professor of Contemporary Spanish Studies on the news that the Spanish Prime Minister has fallen and Prime Minister Sanchez has taken his place. Oh, our man behind the glass is wasted. <laughs> Give him his own radio show downstairs on Virgin Radio. Perfectly chosen music uh, on the back of the discussion about the Spanish political change. Paul and Janie say on the Twitter, don't always agree with all that George Galloway has to say, but his radio shows on talk radio are truly encapsulating and a great example of first-class broadcast journalism. George's shows are a must-listen. Thank you indeed, Paul and Janie, for that. Carl uh, Michael says, Hi, George. Since your last visit to Manchester, the potholes have doubled in quantity and size. I suffer them daily on my bike, and the 400 death toll may well rise if this issue isn't tackled. Budget cuts right across the board kill. Actually, I'm in Manchester very regularly, Carl, and I agree with you. Uh, ECHJ says, Hi, George, I live and cycle in France. The roads are atrocious. I put my life in my hands every time I go out cycling. Kaz Jones, Saint-Gervais-les-Bains. That's a very nice address to have, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, George Galloway of Saint-Gervais-les-Bains, even if the roads are horrible. Uh, Zoran says, uh, trying, uh, they're trying every which way to have a go at Russia. Sad days in Western politics. And Bass Players Union, my old union, says a councillor where I live in Rochdale told me if there's a paint line around a pothole, then the council doesn't need to pay any compensation for damage caused to a vehicle. I doubt that, but uh, it's quite a fly one. And Mark Dinsdale says, well, cyclists should have opened their eyes don't you think? What a cruel and, frankly, idiotic thing to say. Uh, the lunatic up in, uh, in uh, Fort William, 
uh, is on again. He hates me so much, but he listens to my every show, irrespective of the hour, and sends me an SMS at his own expense, 25 pence, plus normal sending charges. Graham, does your wife know you're doing this? Does she know how much you're spending texting somebody that you hate, that you're listening at every hour God sends to somebody that you hate? Anyway, says the SNP has ruined our police force in Scotland. They've nearly cut the force to nothing. It's a disgrace. Crime is only going to get worse in Scotland. I won't read the rest. Uh, Lubna uh, says, thank you for covering Spain's politics. She's listening in Spain, Barcelona, I think. And Mr. Timothy Bobbins uh, says, Croydon is not, I repeat, not the gun and knife capital of anywhere. I'm looking out of the window and it's kids and parents in a playground alongside joggers and dog walkers. Who is this alarmist you are talking to? Well, he's only a 35-year serving police officer. He's only a gun and knife crime expert. I'm not sure that your evidence of one look out of one window in the morning is necessarily a contradiction to what he said. Tyler Durden says, very good interview with Mr. Pothole UK. Health and safety first. And Daniel says, uh, I'm on talk radio at 12.45, talking about prawn personality. Tune in. Are you indeed? Are you indeed? Yes, I'm getting a nod from through the glass. Just to let you know, this is live and developing radio. <laughs> I'm learning from Twitter who's coming on next. Let's hear from Jonathan in Yorkshire. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, George. Welcome, uh, sir. First time calling in. Thanks. Yeah. Um, basically, I just wanted to talk about uh, what's happened in Spain. Okay. Uh, the new the new president, Pedro Sanchez, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of people in Spain, they don't really trust this guy. He's, he's a, the kind of... The red, new prime minister, you mean, he, Sanchez? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, go on. He's kind, of, he's kind of the red side of the neoliberal team, if you know what I mean. Okay. He's um, so he's more Blair than he's Corbyn. Kind of a, yeah, he's more of an Ed Miliband. Oh, okay. All right. Well, and, that's yeah, better than Blair, but not as good as Corbyn. Yeah, but he's um, he's very much a puppet of um, the hierarchy in Pesoy, the uh, Socialist Party. Um, yeah, he's he's not really trusted, and it's debatable whether he even has a program to govern. Well, uh, this possibly came a, a, a little uh, unexpectedly, but when the professor yeah. told me that he only actually has 84 MPs, in other words, yeah. not even uh, a quarter of what he would need uh, to have a majority in the parliament, and that he would be requiring not just the support of Podemos, who frankly would be stupid to give it to him, uh, but yeah. would require regional nationalist parties, which would, of course undercut his support in the rest of Spain, it seemed to me a general election was uh, very, yeah. very likely indeed. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I think you're right about Pablo putting all his cards in with uh, Pedro. I think it would be a mistake. But I think they, the, the real left, which is uh, Pablo and um, the left United, they... Uh, they need to hold this new government to account, really, and pressure them to put in a more progressive programme. Uh, yes. Um, the professor was, uh, if you'll forgive me saying so, and I didn't have time to put this to him because he was in a hurry, uh, was a little complacent, I think, about the uh, place of uh, Spanish politics in the broader EU crisis. He seemed to be mm -hmm. implying... Uh, that none of this has anything to do with the EU. I, I must say I don't agree. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, exactly, yeah. A lot of young Spanish, uh, they've, they've left because of um, how yeah. things are in Spain. Oh, exactly. And, ha and half, of the, very angry. half of the Spanish youngsters under 25 are unemployed. Absolutely. So, okay. yeah, they want, they, they want change. Yeah. 
And well, they're not going to get change on the basis of a socialist party with only 84 MPs, but uh, at least uh, some will say Rajoy has paid the price, not just for the corruption crisis in the PP, uh, but for his mishandling of the Catalan question, don't you think? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, Spain is a very diverse country. It's very complex. And it's not easy to govern. And, uh, yeah, Rajoy's kind of fallen on his sword, with, mainly with corruption. I mean, it's the case that he's fallen from. It's just the tip of the iceberg, really. But, um, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting. Now, why, just as a matter of interest, uh, wh why are you so knowledgeable about Spanish politics? Did you live there? I did, yeah. I did there for, uh, lived there for a while, yeah. Okay. Thinking of going back in this new turbulent moment? Um... I would love to. It's a fantastic country to live in. Uh, I really like the Spanish people. Um, but, yeah, the politics is difficult. Uh, but, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know the old Chinese saying, we are doomed to live in interesting times. Jonathan in Yorkshire, thanks for the call. Well, good news uh, uh, or not, uh, George Osborne's evening standard stands accused of making millions, selling news coverage, to Google and Uber, raising the question, if we needed to raise it, can we trust the media? Now, Phil Hall knows the newspaper game inside and out, former editor of the News of the World, now a PR consultant and good enough to join me here on the mother of all talk shows. Phil, good morning to you. Good morning, George. Now, they have jumped the shark, haven't they? There's there's nothing wrong with a bit of uh, um, um, honest advertising. Uh, we both uh, live on that. Our station wouldn't exist but for that. But everybody knows uh, that when Jaguar are advertising on here, they paid for the space and it's advertising. But if I start talking fondly about Jaguar and nobody knows that I'm doing so because Jaguar have paid uh, my employer a substantial sum of money. Uh, that's a wholly different thing, isn't it? It really is. I think I think it, come, it goes to the very foundation of the integrity of, of, of the press. And certainly, I mean, I've been a journalist for 40-odd years, and local newspapers used to have sponsored content, but it had to be very clearly marked as an advertising feature. You had to use a different font to the rest of the newspaper. Nobody could be mistaken that this was advertising paid for content. And and the lines have become blurred, George. I mean, the Sunday Times, for instance, in their business pages in recent years have had sponsored content. And I have to say, sometimes I've read it and then thought that that looked a little bit too, you know, too nice for you know, too nice a story, really. And then you look and you see sort of hidden in one corner that this is sponsored content. So, you know, these lines are becoming blurred and I, I'm very worried about it. Yeah, especially at a time when um, no, we're both out of newspapers so we can say it openly, uh, yeah. at a time when newspapers are disappearing fast down the plug. Uh, well, and the problem, uh, uh, it? it's it's likely to hasten that, isn't it? It is. I think, that, you know, they are becoming desperate for, for revenues and I understand that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they've got to think out the box. There's no longer enough to rely on advertising and, and cover price. And uh, the more the cover prices go up, the more... Uh, readers abandon newspapers, so they they can't afford to do that anymore. So they're looking for more inventive ways of making money. But uh, I, you know, I, I think there's a, there is a it's a halfway house. As long as it's clearly marked, then there's there's no issue. If Uber want to write a piece themselves and, and advertise, and people know it's been paid for, then that's fine. But when when you lose that sort of uh, independence, and then, then you're coming into my world, aren't you? You're coming into the PR world. And I've got many many. Clients would love to just be able to buy pages in the East Head and say whatever they like, but uh, I just think it would be inappropriate. Yeah, and but they don't um, or wouldn't uh, want to uh, appear in a different font under the heading, under the rubric, uh, advertising uh, content or advertorial or whatever. They they want it to be essentially a subterfuge, which means... I think you're, yeah. It's the customer, right. that, it's the reader that's being cheated. The customer's being conned, aren't they? They're, they're, they're reading something, think it's been independently verified. And I know people have different views about the standard of journalism, but most journalists do try to verify their information. And and you know that as a reader. That's why you're buying it. You, it's that trust and that bond of, you know, the journalist is looking out for me. They're fighting against, the, you know, the great and good and making sure that, that there's no abuse. And suddenly if people start controlling 
the airways, well, we, we, you know, we, we're, we're sort of heading down the Pravda route where people can just, you know, governments or big companies can just buy whatever they want in, in a newspaper and say whatever they want. That would, be, that would be wholly inappropriate, in my view. Now, it's a controversial outfit uh, altogether. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that uh, I knew the owner when he was the KGB resident at the Soviet <laughs> embassy in Kensington, and his right. son... Uh, Mr. Lebedev, who does most of the work nowadays, uh, is, was at my wedding. You knew he was the only billionaire present because he was the only one wearing jeans who didn't bring a present or even a card. Um, <laughs> now, so full disclosure here. But it is odd, the standard. It's first of all free. Uh, it's yeah. secondly owned by a KGB officer at a time of heightened Russophobia. Uh, it is... Uh, it's uh, appointed as its editor, a man with about 20 other jobs who used to be the <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer in the uh, Tory government, George Osborne, and now this. It's it's uh, sailing uh, on uh, close to the wind, don't you think? It is close to the wind, and of course its circulation has increased vastly. I mean, I think it's just about the biggest circulation it's ever had. Because yeah, because it's free. The it's free, and it's left on trains, and people pick it up and read it again. So we shouldn't underestimate its influence. It's very influential. But, uh, I, you know, I think, certainly I read it, and I, I don't know George Osborne, but I read it, and I look at the politics, and I think, well, I know I know there's a, you know, there's a bent coming in that direction because of his background, and, you know, whether he you know, hates Mrs May or whatever it is. I'm reading... With that knowledge, many newspapers, people don't understand their, their, their political leanings. Yes, you know, the Daily Mail, we know that's a supporter of the Prime Minister, for instance, but others are more subtle. So I'm not particularly offended by the fact that George Osborne's editing the, the paper because I think you at least know what to expect and know the, the slant he's going to take. But this sort of under underhand paying for pages and paying for content is, uh, you know, is, is very difficult, I think. I, I can't really see how anybody can argue that that's fair and justified. Can anyone do anything uh, about it, Phil? I mean, uh, I don't know if they're in the new regulation uh, regime uh, or whether uh, whether the government or whether the owner will have second thoughts about it now. Can anyone do anything well, about it's this? A good, it's a good question. I would I would have thought that this is a a matter for the um, you know the media select committee to call George Osborne, which would be interesting in itself. Yes, to, yes, I'm, to, you know, to, I'm pretty sure. Having heard you, they'll be doing that right away. <laughs> I mean, that's a good idea, isn't it, to at least, you know, get him to explain precisely what's happening. And, you know, the Independent Press Complaints Commission, uh, you know, is a new body, is trying to, to carry weight and establish its authority. So, again, you would imagine that they would start looking at it and trying to investigate how, how deep this is going. And because I, I, I've seen some quotes from the standard saying this isn't happening, but, you know, clearly it's been talked about, isn't it? I don't think it's... Uh, been proven yet that this these deals have been done. I think one or two companies have leaked that the standards have been to them and talked to them, but uh, as yet, I don't think the copy's been appearing. Is, is that right, John? No, I think it hasn't appeared, but the deal was done. 500 grand yeah. was the deal. Uh, yeah. Your your company pays <coughs> Mr. Lebedev £500,000 for something called the 2020 Initiative, I think it was called, uh, to make yeah. life better in London. And, uh, and for that 500000 uh, you'll be included positively in all the all the stories. I think that was the deal. That's hard, isn't it? That is, I mean, for a journalist to sit there writing a story about Uber, maybe you're writing <laughs> a story about black taxi protests exactly, against yeah. Uber. How yeah. on earth can you write that knowing you've got to be you've got to be kind to Uber? And uh, it does. I mean, the whole purpose of newspapers is to hold people, companies, everyone to account. Yeah. And if you're effectively being bought off and saying yeah. well, you can't hold these particular companies to account, then well, that's I right. Think, I mean, uh, I, I really do think in some way which, like the camel, is difficult to define but easy to recognize, it is the yeah. crossing of a, a very, very important uh, line. I mean, let's let, look, we're not beating about the bush. Um, if, if I listened to an ad here now on this radio station and then launched an attack on the advertiser uh, that yeah. I'd just been listening to, I'd, that would be pretty stupid and get me yeah. the sack uh, pretty quickly. I'm not allowed, for example, to refer to ads point. that have just been on. Uh, so I wouldn't do that. But it's a different thing to be told, actually, you've got to start saying nice things about that company yeah. because they've right. given us money. I couldn't do That's that. I'm sure you couldn't do yeah. that. Uh, so and I don't you, see how anyone with integrity could do that. 
And when you're talking five hundred thousand pounds, it's not a small sum of money. No. You know, these, these are people paying this money for a reason. It's because they've got reputational reputational issues, which are probably deserved, and they're feeling they can somehow buy back their reputation. Well, reputation's got to be earned. They can't be bought. Yeah, not on our watch, Phil. <laughs> so it didn't happen in my day at the News of the World. We always told the truth, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Fair and balanced, I seem to recall. Phil Hall, former editor of the News of the World and uh, a great newspaper figure, now a PR consultant, talking about the extraordinary jumping of the shark uh, of the London Evening Standard. Thanks for that, Phil. And uh, Palestine is X, says, Hi, George, it's grim up north. People struggling to get work. 2,000 trains cancelled since the 18th of May. Absolute chaos. Failing grailing. Great show as always, Maestro. Thank you very much for that. Very well written. Uh, Chris Smith says, uh, Listening to George Galloway on talk radio, refreshing, refreshing change from mealy-mouthed, one-sided discussion on the BBC. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, Bob McNabb says, I think I'm a closet socialist. This George Galloway fella on talk radio has views that resonate with a lot of my own. Just can't see me voting Labour, though. Thanks, Bob. And Patrick says, significant point by Galloway, uh, mother of all talk shows, about there being too many countries. Many divisions exist where there should be unity. Uh, for example, the island of Ireland. However, regional attempts at unity, for example, the EU do not work. What is needed is a united world government of nation states. Good luck with that, Pat. The communicipalist says seismic shifts in Europe reveal the profoundly undemocratic nature of the EU, desperately shutting down outbreaks of popular democracy and invalidating voting. Ironic, the EU doctrine of subsidiarity is now an existential threat, according to Mr. Soros. Well, that takes the prize as the best written tweet of the day uh, so far. I particularly like uh, the phrase, desperately shutting down outbreaks of popular democracy. As a matter of fact, that is a virtually perfect, pristine description of what's happening the outbreak of Brexit, the outbreak of anti-austerity government in Greece, the outbreak of populism in Italy, uh, the outbreak uh, in Catalonia. The, in, it's like they're firefighting, desperately firefighting these outbreaks of popular democracy, whatever view you take. By the way, somebody asked me what that song was. It's uh, Bailamos by Enrique Iglesias uh, and a very, very fine piece it was too. Um, uh, chosen by our wizards behind the glass. Uh, I must say the time is flying today because it's almost the end of the second hour, but the good news is there's another hour after this. So I need to hear from you during that hour. It's 0344 499 1000 and how it works is you call us and we call you back. So it needn't cost you more than a penny or two and we'll put you on the radio. There are people listening all over the country and all over the world to this show, to this open university of the airwaves. But you can also email through the website at talksport.co.uk and you can text, text the word TALK followed by your, uh, uh, your message uh, to... Eight seven, treble two, but that'll cost you twenty five pence, plus your standard network rate. Or you can tweet me for free at George Galloway at Talk Radio. This is the mother of all talk shows because it is a Friday. It's just not at the normal time, and I'll be here until one o'clock. Now, uh, Tiny Hands has been busy. Donald Trump usually blusters and threatens, but this time. He has followed through. He has acted. Uh, he said he would put America first. Is that what he has done with the imposition of swinging, crippling steel tariffs on uh, Chinese, Japanese, European, British uh, exports of steel and aluminium to the United States? Will these countries have the guts 
to stand up to him and to impose retaliatory measures upon U.S. exports into their countries? Or will they roll over and take it? And will, in any case, what Trump has done actually put America first? Or will it be more damaging elsewhere in the U.S. economy uh, than it at first appears? Shahab Khan, reporter and political columnist on The Independent, has been looking into this very issue, and I'm glad to say he joins us now. Shahab, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Was it a surprise that Trump uh, did it, that it wasn't just idle bluster, as is often the case? I don't think it was. I mean, it, it is something that he has been mentioning time and time again. I think you make a good point that he has a tendency of making comments and not actually following through. But I think we saw this coming. It's been in the in the works for some time. But I think it's what happens now is the big thing. And what we've had a lot of talk of in the last few months from the likes of Boris Johnson and Liam Fox is this idea of a fantastic trade deal with the US. And I think this attitude that Donald Trump has really puts a spanner in the works and shows that that's not a nailed-on guarantee. Well, of course, we don't have a, a trade deal with the US uh, that would preclude that. Um, but if we did, uh, they wouldn't have been able to impose them. I appreciate there are two ifs in that uh, in that uh, sentence, but um, I'm not sure it's necessarily, as you may be implying, an argument against Brexit. No, no, I mean, it, I'm not making an argument for or against Brexit. What I'm saying is that what we've had for quite a long time is Liam Fox and Boris Johnson especially cite the fact that a trade deal with the US that may or may not happen in the future is one of the great positives that will come out of leaving the EU. And I think Donald Trump's behaviour both now and in the last six months, I mean, you mentioned how a lot of what he says, we don't know if we should take it at face value, whether it's hot air, whether he's going to actually pull through with it. And I think that is something that we really need to focus on. If we're pinning our hopes on a fantastic trade deal with the US, we have to bear in mind the man who is currently in charge and the tariffs that have been slapped on now demonstrate his attitude and the fact that he is, unfortunately for Britain, pushing this American America first isolationist approach, which won't really benefit us if we're going for a trade deal. Um, now, what will the uh, victims, uh, if that's not too strong a word, of, of Trump's action, what will they uh, do about it? They, they have the option of applying retaliatory measures against U.S. Uh, imports. Do you think they will? I mean, I that would be disastrous, I think, if we enter a trade war with the US. I mean, it would be bad. The CBI have come out and said it would be bad for both sides. It's not good for global relations. It's not good for global trade. But again, on the other side, do we really expect those who've been impacted with these tariffs to lay down and accept them? We're entering, we're entering uncharted territory. For a long time, we've been talking about global trade as if it's a nailed-on guarantee. It's something that everyone benefits from. And for the first time, we've got a leader of the free world who is going against that tradition and bucking the trend. Mm. Well, what it may happened? be your leader, Shahabi. Certainly uh, ain't mine. Uh, we can't, af <laughs> we can't uh, accuse him of lying, though, because this was his election campaign promise, wasn't it? Yes, and this is something that his voter base in the US will definitely be happy with. He is been saying he's going to do this. He's been saying he'll protect U.S. jobs and the way to do that, he thinks, is to slap on a huge tariff and protect the industries in the U.S. He said that at rally after rally, it was met with rapturous applause and he stood by his promise on that. His base will be happy. It will shore up his position with his own supporters. They will see this as an America first strategy and America first policy but the impact it could have on a global scale could be unprecedented we've not seen anything like this mm. especially from the country which has positioned itself as the bastion of capitalism the bastion of free trade the bastion of economics to do this really throws a spanner in the works in the way that we as a global society have operated for the last 30 to 40 years. Sure um, and of course especially in the Rust Belt states which swung it for Trump where the former smokestacks had uh, been, many thought, permanently extinguished. And now these steel plants in the U.S. will be reopening. Others that were still open will be expanding 
um, because nobody's going to buy steel at 25% dearer from anyone else, are they? Yeah, I mean, that's the point of the policy. That's exactly what Trump wants. It's what he's promised. American jobs for American people. He has complained time and time again that he thinks that Chinese imports are having a massive impact on U.S. jobs. This is another step in that direction. It's isolationist policies to keep jobs in the U.S. But what happens to an industry that hasn't been thriving for a long period of time when you decide, no, get back on the horse, start producing again? It will take time. And the impact it could have on the U.S. economy could be detrimental. Experts are coming out and saying it's a lose-lose situation. Both sides are going to be worse off because of this. But I don't think Trump cares. I think this is about sticking to his pledges and it's about firing up his voter base and shoring up his own support. Well, it's economic nationalism, isn't it? It's uh, it's uh, a, a, a recoiling from globalization. I mean, he's also sanctioned Canada and Mexico uh, with this uh, measure who are partners of the U.S. in, in NAFTA. Um, it's a uh, circling of the wagons technique. It's economic nationalism. It's putting our own people first, as they say. Um, this is the new zeitgeist, I think. I mean, this is the platform that Donald Trump stood on. It's There's an element of surprise that he's pulled through with it, but it's not as surprising as if it's not a rabbit out of the hat. He said this was what he was going to do. It is a platform that has been supported by vast numbers of people in the U.S. He got millions and millions of votes saying that he was going to do this. He said he's going to protect U.S. jobs. He's even been quite clear on how he's going to do it. He's been saying things like the U.S. have been taken for fools by the international community. They've been giving out handouts. They've been helping other countries, and he's not going to do that anymore. He's doing what he said he was going to do. And the repercussions of that could be huge. Any idea how the markets have reacted to it? We'll see. I mean, it, knee-jerk reactions and knee-jerk responses are never a good thing to analyse too much. The responses that we analyse and look at over the next two, three, four, five, six months will determine how the markets have responded to it. I think the biggest thing right now is the political outcome on what we see both here and in the U.S. and how relations with allies are determined because of this. I can almost guarantee you there are going to be a number of phone calls that Donald Trump is going to be getting over the next couple of weeks from a range of countries that he's working on, on a range of different subjects, who will be saying, why on earth are you doing this? This is bad for everyone. And how he deals with that could affect America's position in the global economy and the global world. Shahab Khan, a reporter, political columnist of The Independent. Thanks for joining us on that. What do you think on the Donald Trump steel tariff issue? 0344 499 1000. Or you can tweet uh, a response, as Patrick Vidin has, saying uh, USA's tariff on steel, 25%, aluminium, 10%, will ultimately lead to affected countries negotiating and all-out trade wars unlikely. Similar talks with China have led to some trade deficit, $375 billion, by the way, in 2017, balancing. WTO rules need strengthening. And here's another one uh, that I haven't yet read. It's about uh, Abramovich. Now he's applying to become an Israeli citizen, and Britain can't ban an Israeli from Britain, apparently. Go figure. No, uh, that's not uh, accurate. Um, he still would not be able to work in Britain. He'd still need a work permit. And given the time they took to give him a visitor's visa, they're not going to be in a hurry to give him a work permit. And my own view, I may be wrong, is that he's had enough. Uh, he's put enough money into Chelsea and he's not going to throw another billion uh, where that came from. And uh, my opinion is he's begun ineluctably the long retreat might be a long one but it'll be a retreat from uh, English football somebody else will have to buy Chelsea Matt in Swansea says great to hear you again George I used to listen to you 20 years ago on the original talk radio along with other brilliant presenters fantastic thank you Matt those were the days not quite 20 I started here in January of 2006 so that's uh, 12 years and counting. Uh, it just feels like 20. Uh, David Northwich says, George, I must admit, I've never been a fan of yours. 
because our political views differ. However, I have listened to the show all week, and it's brilliant. You debate all subjects and listen to both sides and provide real insight into the subjects. I enjoy the fact that you even allow the mad people who hate you to air their views. I'm now a fan and will listen to your other show. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Dave. You've no idea how uh, valuable to me these kind of SMSs are, and I hope it's being clipped and sent off to the regulator right now. And uh, someone talking about the regulator in terms that I cannot quote says, Cricket on BBC or Orator Galloway? Don't think Suleiman had to make such a difficult decision. <coughs> well, you could always record the cricket and listen to it later. Andy Stewart, that was. I grew up listening to that. Darn, what's your trousers? Um, now, <clears throat> I don't know if you saw the Colombo versus George Galloway meme on Twitter yesterday. It was very, very good, actually, even though it didn't get my accent quite right. Uh, it was uh, a, an honour for me to be bracketed with Colombo because I totally loved Colombo. Uh, now, one more thing. Uh, on the Shahab Khan uh, interview, when I asked if uh, the victims of uh, Trump's action today will retaliate, uh, he threw up his hands in uh, horror uh, at the very thought of it. No, that would be disastrous, he said. It would lead to a trade war. But this is a trade war. Trump has just declared a trade war. The only issue is whether you're going to fight back or not. Now, as I hope I inferred in the interview, um, Trump has every right to uh, take whatever action uh, he likes in relation to the U.S. economy. And as for isolationism, a good deal more U.S. isolationism would be a very good thing, in my opinion. In fact, I don't care if we never see another American president in the world again. Let them attend to their own, frankly, disastrously undermined house. Let them attend to their own business. I myself believe in a planned economy. Uh, free, just because you slap the word free before something, doesn't mean it's good. Just because you call it free trade, doesn't mean it's beneficial trade. Doesn't mean it's beneficial either to the people you're trading with or indeed to you. So I believe in planning our economy. And we should now sit, get down to planning uh, our steel industry. We wouldn't be able to as long as we're in the EU, but now that we're leaving the EU, we can plan our own steel industry. We can make it compulsory for uh, people uh, using steel in Britain to use British steel with appropriate management and regulation to make sure that efficiency and price is controlled. Uh, I'm in favour of that kind of thing. That's my kind of economy. Uh, so I'm not joining those who are denouncing Trump. After all, he is only keeping a promise he made uh, upon being elected to the blue-collar workers of America who had been abandoned by the paragons, the high priests of free trade, the Clintons. Juan is in Wigan. Juan, welcome. Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, hi. It just, um, I mean, I've just... You've touched upon this before about all the the spontaneous wildfires that are happening all over Europe. Yeah, that obviously it was Brexit. quite a good metaphor, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I think if you think of the de facto coup d'état that they tried to do in Italy, yeah, and the, the turmoil that is happening in Spain, uh, these things are not totally unrelated. No, not at all. Are you very aware of the, the situation with the youth? And uh, yeah, the, the Professor Emeritus uh, sought to imply, I thought, that they were unrelated. Uh, but I think they're entirely related. Yes, and, uh, and on that note, so because you've touched upon that, I mean, I just want to obviously praise you and Richard Medley, because, I mean, you have an epic role to play to avoid people falling into the trap of fascism. Let me explain this a bit further. I mean, someone like the case of Roseanne Barr, that she's gone completely into the conspiracy theory, you know, realm, turning into supremacist, is something very easy to make because, you know, you can blame always somebody else. You can blame the foreigner instead of blaming those who, you know, are curtailing the economic development by imposing, you know, 
monetary policies and things like that. So it's just to make clear that, you know, we have to distinguish between the people from Europe, the hardworking people. Yeah, of people, course, yeah. And those, and the elite, you know. I think it's a it's a big it's an important dis, you know distinction. It to is. Make. It is. I think we should start uh, by uh, banning ourselves from describing America as the leader of the free world, as Shahab Khan rather oddly did. First of all, uh, it, it's not a free world, and secondly, who elected America as its leader, especially an America led by a giant with the mind of a child? Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that in this post-truth whatever they call it, the label of, you know, all these fabrication, you know, that somebody, we live in, you know, in the age of miracles. This guy was killed yesterday and in the afternoon he appeared, you know, apparently yeah. killed by, by... They're rising like Lazarus all over exactly. the place in the, yeah. of, uh, yeah. in the age of Putin. Yeah, so basically my, my main point is that oh, with all this turmoil, it is obviously it's not an accident after the 2008 crisis and we know history enough to see that when the chips are down... You know, every, the, the usual suspects are always the ones suffering. And people try to, you know, inside, like this Tommy Robinson, you know, hatred between people. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not an issue between the people from Spain or the people of, of Greece, you know, the people of Italy. Of, you know, it's the elite that really, really has complete control of, of the economies. And they can't relinquish that. And, and they're scared of people like Jeremy Corbyn because obviously. You know, somebody like Jeremy Corbyn would try to implement things like renationalizing the railways and the steelwork and things of that nature. And I think it's really important that people like you and the media, you know, act as a very, very important firewall of, you know, integrity, because otherwise people are going to mistrust the media, go into the Internet, go to a dodgy YouTube channel and get all these crazy ideas. Yeah, it's a very good point. Uh, just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's any truer automatically than anything you read in, you know, the Daily Express. Other newspapers are available. Uh, you have to be savvy enough to have your own take on things and look for evidence uh, uh, on the Internet from people that over a period you can come to trust. And that is happening to me now. I have one and a half million followers on social media. I've got a, a, an RT show on Sky. I've got this show. Uh, I'm on Patreon. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. So if you think that you can trust at least uh, what I'm saying enough to listen to it, watch it, uh, then I'd, you know I, I, there are many other people uh, who are doing the same kind of things. Um, then you have, if you like... Uh, whole series of different platforms that you can draw information and analysis from. In today's world, as I've often said, ignorance is a choice, you know. Uh, you don't have to rely on the Daily Express. You, you really can find out other takes on issues. You know, there are more serious. I mean, I like, for example, the fact that you have guests you know, of different ideological persuasions. Yes. But they all know what they're talking about. I mean, I just delighted to hear people like Peter Auburn or Peter Hitchens or, you know, even though I may not agree with everything they say, but at least there is an argumentation. You can have a conversation with them instead of being a shouting match. Yeah. So instead of saying, oh, you know, Putin is this, blah, 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 Corbyn is this, that, that, and that's that. So I think it's important that intellectual integrity is preserved in the media because otherwise we'll go to the Wild West. And, and that's all I wanted because I, I know no, that... No, it's a very, very good point. I just want to ask you one more thing, if I may. Are yeah. you Spanish, one? I am Spanish, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you but tell I'm... us anything about the new prime minister? Well, uh, it is interesting because, I mean, it is very mistrusted. I mean, to put an equivalent... Um, in a way, if you can, you could think of him as a kind of a Ed Miliband type of character, uh, uh, and it's um, it, it's basically pledging for consensus at this moment. Mm. But it's quite very difficult. It's got very difficult. It's very complicated because yeah. you lost me at the words Ed Miliband. Actually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what so, could possibly go wrong? Exactly. exactly. Juan in Wigan. Many, yeah. many thanks for your wisdom and your kind words. I'm George Galloway. I'm in for Mike Graham for another half hour. 0344 499 1000. Well, a machine gun 
17 bullets in Brent last night, and as Toby Gillis just told us, uh, a woman stabbed to death in Brent today. I'm having to move out of Brent because I have too many children to live in such an obviously dangerous place. But I'm lucky, I'm mobile, I'm able to do that. I'm a tenant, I can rent anywhere. By the grace of God, I have the money to pay the rent. What about all the rest that I'm going to leave behind in Brent? Don't they deserve to live in a place where they're not likely to be stabbed, to be shot by a machine gun? It's unbelievable, this story, this situation, <clears throat> and even more unbelievable is the quietude of City Hall and of Whitehall and Westminster about it. Um, Cassif says, George, I think the UK should put huge tariffs on steel and coal imports. It will help tens of thousands get work. And Tyler Durden says, politicians, media hacks and lobbyists claimed that stock markets will crash if the Leave vote wins the referendum. If Trump wins the presidential election and if a trade war is started by Trump, nothing happened. They say the same about a Corbyn win. And Mark Challoner says China and the EU have been charger, charging greater import taxes on American goods than America has been charging for their cheap imports. Why shouldn't Trump put America first? The American people elected him to do exactly that kind of the point I just made myself. And Neville Thumbcatch says you can't plan an economy. It's too big. Yeah, the market's doing a better job, isn't it? Mohammed is on the line from Maidenhead. Welcome, Mohammed. Good afternoon, George. How afternoon. you doing? Afternoon. I'm by the grace yeah. of God. Good. Thank you. Good to hear. Good. I'm just, I'm actually in a taxi at the minute with taxi driver. We were just talking. I thought him on coming on the show. So I'll give him a shout out. So it's a shout out to taxi driver. Uh, to all uh, taxi to... drivers everywhere in the land. A big up everywhere to you. Drive safely. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. And you know, obviously, um, yeah, so I'm just, the, the purpose of my call today was just really to talk about um, the media because I was just giving it some reflection. Obviously, my opinions aren't that strong about it, but I just wanted to hear obviously your opinions, George, and maybe we could um, see, see if we can agree or disagree because my opinion is that the media just portray a lot of information. The public who are viewing it, a lot of them are powerless. So I just feel like it's a, um, it doesn't create any good. I mean, obviously, if there's media portraying something which can raise public awareness, if there's, if there's media portraying something which can, you know, get people to pray for those who are being oppressed, for instance, if it's a negative um, connotation that's being portrayed, um, I just find that a lot of the things in the media, it's not, it's not, a, it's not making any good happen from, from portraying it in the media. Do you hear what I'm saying? Well, uh, not really. I mean, are you saying that the, for example, this crime story that I'm talking about, I, I, do you think that we should not talk about it? If it can warn people of the dangers of what can happen in the public, so if it's as, as a warning or as a raising the public awareness, I completely hear, hear that you should talk about it, George. I'm not discouraging you to talk. Obviously, you're somebody who talks to try and evoke change. You're somebody who tries to, to talk to try and um, evoke um, positive change. But a lot of the time, some people even feed off negative media, George. You know, they feed off it. So I'm, not, I'm obviously not personalizing this to your, to your story. I'm just talking in general. If you feel like... Well, everyone has, uh, everyone has an angle. Uh, and uh, everyone uh, has a duty uh, to speak truthfully. Uh, yes. I believe before God that I can say that I speak truthfully. I, I may be wrong, I may be right, but I'm not lying to you. And I'm telling you uh, what I genuinely believe to be true. And on the crime story or on the Trump story or on Russia or on Abramovich, I'm telling you what I genuinely believe. Uh, I'm not telling you what somebody's paid me to tell you. Uh, no one has bought me, rented me, uh, and neither would I allow anyone to sell me to anyone else. Now, unfortunately, that's not that common in the media. In the mainstream media, most people, uh, it seems to me, uh, and I say this truthfully and regretfully, uh, most people are saying what they believe the prevailing orthodoxy wants them to say. They want to take the line and eventually begin to do so automatically, in a Pavlovian way. 
in a way that doesn't even require a moment's thought. Uh, they know, for example, that this is the era, in Britain at least, of uh, hate Russia, hate Putin. So you get a flash across your screen that a prominent uh, Kremlin critic has been murdered in a hail of bullets in Kiev, and you automatically splash that as A, truthful, and B, almost certainly, the work of the dastardly president of Russia. The fact that then, within hours, it turns out that the man hasn't been murdered, and therefore Putin didn't murder him, doesn't seem to cause even a moment's pause before on to the next attack. And that's why I despise virtually all of the mainstream media. And the good news for me is that the great majority of the public are also walking, some of them marching, in that very same direction. That's why uh, the traditional purveyors of news and analysis are uh, going... Um, uh, I, I want to find a polite way of saying this, are going down the tubes at a rate of knots. Mohammed. Yes, George. No, obviously, you've given a very um, specific example, um, talking about the Ukrainian uh, example, but I was just, I was talking more in general, George, because I just feel like, um, like, let's say, let's, let's look at the Iraq war, for instance, George. You got, you got dismissed from the uh, parliament for speaking the truth about the Iraq war, and it was all put on the news, um, and everyone knew about it, but what can anyone do about it? We're powerless. And obviously in Parliament, you often use the term two, butts, two cheeks of the same backside. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if, if, if those in power are, are exactly that, and those who are viewing it on the TV screens, or obviously people who go out and speak the truth like yourself, we're powerless. So we've got all this information we have to digest, this negative information daily that we have to, you know, we have to digest into our minds, into our hearts, into our souls. And I just wonder what, what good it promotes. You know, it's... it's it's well, not, you're not at all. You're not at all powerless. A apart from the fact that you've got a vote, which is an obvious power, as as do the other forty-five million or so who have a vote in uh, Britain today. You have the power of your voice, which you use eloquently. You have the power to engage with others in social media, a power that we never had before. You have the power to uh, persuade your cab driver there uh, to have him listen to what we are talking about. You have the power to uh, influence your workmates, your family members, your neighbors, and so on. So we're very far from powerless. It's the uh, belief that we're powerless that, in a way, is our weakest uh, point. Um, because if we believe we're powerless, we are powerless. If we believe we're powerful, we are powerful. And mm -hmm. if we stand up, uh, then we can prevail. And, of course, the political scene has changed now since I used to say two cheeks of the same backside. Whatever you could say about Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn or even more uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, they're definitely not two cheeks of the same backside, are they? No, no, you're right about that. Jeremy Corbyn isn't a cheek of a backside. He's he's marvellous. And I, I, was, I was only saying that because, obviously, they have the audacity to, to remove you from Parliament. So, obviously, I was thinking, OK, so does it have to be... Uh, you have to be of a certain moral standards to be within Parliament now or something. But well, I don't know how right. bad you'd have to be. Uh, but uh, the Parliament as a whole is, uh, in my opinion, an augie and stable uh, of corruption and incompetence and ineptitude and has presided over a disastrous decline in British national life. But it doesn't need to be that way. You get the parliament that you vote for. You get the members of parliament that you vote for. And if you're voting for sheep, uh, don't be surprised if they bray all the way to the trough. Thanks very much, Mohammed in Maidenhead. Well, no sooner uh, than I said I was out of there, the Metropolitan Police have issued a statement in relation to Brent. Superintendent Tim Alexander from the Borough of Brent said, quote, Overnight we found ourselves in the unusual position of having to deal with three violent incidents 
in our borough of Brent. I understand the community's concerns regarding last night's events, but I would like to reassure the people who live and work in Brent that we remain a safe and vibrant borough that rarely sees incidents of such violence. I'm sorry, uh, Superintendent, but that's simply not true. One of the incidents was sadly the murder of a young woman in the prime of her life. However, I'd like to confirm that we have a man in his 40s in custody and we are not seeking anyone else in connection with this incident. I can also confirm that the victim and the suspect were known to each other and that the crime happened inside a private residential property. Earlier in the evening, the borough also had a shooting. Well, that's one way of putting it. It's a bit like saying Cristiano Ronaldo is a footballer. Yes, it was a shooting. It was a machine gun shooting of 17 bullets. Who writes this stuff? Anyway, back to his quotes. Earlier in the evening, the borough also had a shooting and a stabbing within two hours of each other. Whilst this is of concern, I'd like to reiterate that my officers are working around the clock to identify, locate and apprehend those responsible. The community, he says, can expect to see extra officers on the streets of Brent over the coming days, and I would urge anyone who has any concerns to feel free to approach them. Anyone who'd rather speak to an officer in private can do so by calling Brent Police via 101 or contact your local neighbourhood policing team. I would encourage anyone with information about any of these incidents to call police on 101. You can also contact Crime Stoppers anonymously by calling 0800 555 111 or online at crimestoppers-uk.org. Sorry, Superintendent Tim Alexander is the father of, by the grace of God, many young children living in Brent. That doesn't reassure me at all. Now, finally, on a less serious matter, if indeed it can be so described. We have Daniel Maskery, biologist and lead author on the important paper, which looks at whether prawns have personalities. Daniel, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks now, the on. report uh, of which you're the lead author, it almost had, it seemed to me, um, an, it was almost an anti-capitalist metaphor. Let me read you the first sentence of what I've got in front of me. Risk-taking crustaceans tended to do worse while competing for sustenance, and that those shyer prawns were better at controlling food sources. In other words, the prawns that didn't take risks did best. That's uh, quite an unusual metaphor, don't you think? Um, yeah, fairly, fairly unusual. I mean, it's just... Were you surprised um, by it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we were expecting, obviously, it would make sense for individuals that are, um, you know, bolder, take more risks. You'd expect them to do better when they're competing with others. And it's uh, unusual that we found that that wasn't the case. But then we think that it's probably because if you're weaker, you're likely to have to try and find other ways to get access to things that stronger individuals uh, are probably more likely to just be able to access closer to home. So if, you've, if you're weaker, you need to evolve alternative strategies to basically do the same things that stronger, stronger individuals can just do by virtue of being stronger, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, the bigger surprise is that prawns, therefore, can be said to have discernible personalities. Yeah, so what we mean by that is that... Um, Within, it's not like personality, as we describe it, is this way that different individuals in the same species behave differently from one another consistently. So it's not entirely how you might think of personality in people, but there is this people have personality by that definition, and so do individuals of lots of other species. When you think about personality, it's not a uniquely necessarily human phenomenon in the way that you might think that it is. Not quite. Uh, we know that from higher primates already. Yeah. But the fact but that even, it's true of crustaceans yeah. is a surprise. Exactly. Well, it's true of uh, crustaceans, um, it, lots of insect species, birds. 
pretty much across the animal kingdom, wherever you look, you see this phenomenon. And is this unconscious or conscious behavior? Is a prawn choosing to be adventurous or is it merely genetically thus programmed? Um, it's likely to be genetically programmed. Uh, we've looked, I mean, we, we haven't looked at it, but other researchers have looked into the genetics of these differences. Within humans, we know that there is a genetic basis for some aspects of personality. Um, so in lower organisms, you, can't, you wouldn't be able to say that a prawn is necessarily choosing to do anything because it's, uh, you know, its cognition is really, really simple. Um, so, yeah, more genetic, genetically based, and then also based on the environment that different individuals might find themselves in, which then affects the way that that genetic uh, code is expressed, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, now, what will be the value uh, of this uh, paper? I'm not saying we should only uh, do things that have a value. Some things are worth doing uh, f in themselves. But uh, do you see any application of this work? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting because, because we know, as, as we were saying, we know that evolution plays a role in, in the way that these individuals behave. So if the conditions that they've evolved to deal with change, so in this example in rock pools, rock pools are very changeable environments anyway, but if those environments change, maybe due to climate change or any other human intervention, some individuals might then struggle to adapt to that change. And especially in species like prawns, which are commercially important that could cause down the line fairly large problems for them seeing as we already put them under a lot of pressure simply by fishing them and eating them in the first place so just on the basis of commercial species it could be problematic down the line essentially and strategies maybe need to be put in place how low in the food chain are prawns i must uh, in the interest of full disclosure say i do like eating them uh, but i sometimes uh, have a qualm about eating lobster, uh, because I somehow imagine that uh, the lobster quite possibly is conscious of the fact that it's treated rather badly by us up to the point that we eat it. Yeah. Well, we know that uh, in, on the topic of lobsters, there's been a lot of work recently on whether, because obviously people put lobsters in pots alive, and there's been a lot of talk recently um, on whether lobsters actually feel pain in the sense that we might describe pain. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to come to the conclusion that may actually be the case. So if lobsters can, prawns, obviously, as you say, are lower down the food chain than lobsters. They are bottom feeders, essentially, so they'll just eat anything, pretty much. They'll eat, they'll be predators, they'll be scavengers, they'll eat whatever's available. But if, if you could say that a lobster might feel pain, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that even simpler crustaceans like prawns might also be said to be not aware, but have some sort of, you know, um, nervous response to these things that might cause pain in us. I, I, it's not every day I get a lobster and prawn expert on the radio, so let me ask you, uh, for my own interest, one further question. How long do prawns live? I mean, lobsters live an enormous amount of time if you don't catch them and eat them. Uh, what about prawns? Uh that's actually a difficult question. Uh, prawns, the ones that we're studying in, in the wild wouldn't live that long because they're highly predated. So they grow quite fast. They uh, have yearly cycles of reproduction where they produce eggs. So in the wild, it could be anywhere from maybe one to five years in the lab. As with any species, you could probably keep them for longer, but not to the same extent that a lobster might live, as, as you say, for 50 or 60 or however long they might live for. Daniel Masgrey, biologist, lead author on the important new paper on whether or not prawns have personalities.